A few comments on the sovereignty of Parliament. It's worth considering where the idea came from and how it developed. Our ancient ancestors, when they talked about their nationality, would define it in terms of the relationship they had to the king of the area. So you were English or French because you owed your loyalty to the king of France or the king of England. And of course, geographically, those uh, areas could change over time. But as time progressed, the idea moves away from a personal relationship towards a relationship with the land. And the concept of a nation-state begins to develop. And with it, the philosophers come along and try and define that nation-state. And they talk about the concept of sovereignty. The idea that for every state there is uh, a source of authority from which all the other institutions get their authority. Now, Hobbes in England takes this a stage further and argues that in a state there can only be one sovereign. Now, in the earliest days, uh, that wasn't very complicated. The king, the sovereign, was sovereign in that sense. But let's look back at some of English history. We start with James I, had been James VI of Scotland and comes down now as uh, the new king of England once uh, Elizabeth has died. He believed that he was king, quote, by the divine right. He was put on the throne by God. He had the sovereignty, it was his parliament and his courts. Now James was uh, an astute politician as well as being king. Sadly his son wasn't so astute and came into great conflict with his parliament and ultimately that led to the English Civil Wars and uh, in a hall not very far from where I'm speaking now he was put on trial by parliament and uh, um, they convicted him and he was executed in January uh, 1649. You could argue that this is the first assertion of the sovereignty of Parliament. They had the right to decide if the king should remain as king. Because it was the opposite view that Charles took, his view that he was sovereign. Now, for uh, a number of years, you have a period of Commonwealth where there is no king in England. But after the death of Oliver Cromwell, uh, the new Lord Protector is his son, who is not such an able ruler. And within a matter of months, Parliament makes the decision to invite to the throne of England Charles I's son, who, of course, we know as Charles II. But it was an unwritten understanding that the king would return and wouldn't interfere with the prerogatives of Parliament. Well, again, Charles II was astute. When he died, he was succeeded by James II, who took on Parliament. And there was a period of uh, conflict, and to uh, coin a phrase, uh, he was run out of town by Parliament. Again, Parliament invites someone else to become the monarch. In this case, it's William and Mary. This time, they're not leaving it to uh, unwritten uh, agreements. The Bill of Rights is the result of this. And although you will have seen the American Bill of Rights, uh, which is about the rights of the individual, the Bill of Rights of 1689 is about the rights of Parliament relative to the King. And Wherever, whether you put it in 1649, when Parliament executes the king, or in 1660, where Parliament invites a new king, you can certainly see by 1689 that the sovereign now is Parliament. It is in later years that the uh, doctrine uh, takes on its modern form. So, what are the essential features of the doctrine of sovereignty of Parliament? Well, first of all, you can say that Parliament can do anything it wants. Now, when Dicey, who uh, spoke of this formulation, was talking, he was talking to his students about the English system contrasting it with other systems, particularly the United States. In the United States, Congress cannot do everything that it wants. Um, 
a bill that's passed by the House of Representatives and the Senate and has even got the President's signature can, as a result of the Marbury and Madison case, be struck down by the Supreme Court. Congress is not supreme in the way that the British Parliament is because Congress has to uh, abide by the Constitution. Say, uh, you can also contrast it with a modern French constitution. In that constitution there is a specific article which deals with those areas in which the French Parliament is competent to legislate. If it's not in that list, then the Parliament can't act. The British Parliament, by contrast, there are no no-go areas. The second meaning is that no Parliament is bound by its predecessors. You will come across in uh, the textbooks the term entrenchment. That term means that certain provisions, certain laws, cannot be changed or can only be changed by special procedures in the legislature. So, with the uh, United States, provisions of the Constitution can only be changed if there are special majorities in both houses of Congress and uh, a special majority of uh, state legislatures. In the French Constitution, to ch uh, first of all, uh, it is impossible to, to amend the Constitution to turn it into a monarchy again. Other areas, again, require either special majorities of the two houses meeting together or a referendum uh, in which the uh, people decide. Because, of course, in both the American and the uh, French system, uh, their constitutions declare that the people are sovereign. The third meaning is that no court can question. Again, in the American uh, situation, the Supreme Court can strike down legislation passed by Congress. The British courts have never been able to do that. Uh, they've always taken uh, the view since the sovereignty of Parliament was established that what Parliament says goes, their role is to interpret and, um, and apply it, but they don't overrule it. So what are the current issues? Well, the first is our membership of the European Union. And if you look at the uh, EU treaty, uh, you'll see that uh, there are certain things which member states cannot do whilst they are members of the European Union. And we are bound by that. Does that mean that parliamentary sovereignty is dead? Well, the scholars say no. It means that when we joined the European Union and when we passed the European Communities Act, we, for a time, set aside complete sovereignty. It's almost as if there were a self-denying uh, ordinance. But Parliament ret retains the right at any time to take that power back so we can withdraw from the uh, European Union and we can have full sovereignty uh, as a res uh, result. The other issue uh, where sovereignty comes up is the question of the application of the Human Rights Act. Um, again, that Act uh, puts into English law the um, rights that are in the European Convention on Human Rights. What Parliament decided to do, again, wasn't to allow the courts to overturn an Act because it was incompatible. It allowed, Parliament, it allowed the courts to issue a declaration of incompatibility. And when a declaration like that is made, it is a uh, warning to Parliament that the uh, current law is incompatible, but leaves it up to Parliament as to whether to change the law. Now, if it decides to do so, there's a fast-track procedure to change the law. But Parliament retains its sovereignty because it can, if it so wills, stand out against uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. So, remember the history. Think of those three definitions. Parliament can do whatever it wants. Uh, no parliament is bound by its predecessor. And after we've had the general election, the new parliament that comes in isn't bound by anything that this or previous parliaments had done. It doesn't need any special majorities in parliament to change the law. 
an ordinary act of Parliament passed in the ordinary way according to the, uh, the rules of Parliament is sufficient to change even who can succeed to the throne. And thirdly, courts cannot overturn what Parliament has decided. Now, as we've said, there are, uh, when it comes to the European Union, there is a temporary putting aside of full sovereignty, but Parliament retains the right to take it back. Thank you.